And then, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for coming back. Uh, thanks to, if this is your first time here, we're glad you're here. But let me pray for us, and then we will get going. Father, thank you for tonight. I thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to gather again here at church. Thank you for the uh, men and women that are gathered here, God. And thank you for entrusting us with the message of the gospel, God. And I pray that as we go, uh, as your word says, as we go, God, that we would uh, we would be uh, open and looking for opportunities to share, God. And I pray that you'd help us to just overcome our fears and overcome obstacles that we face, Father, as we as we go about this, God. And thank you that you do the work. And God, we just need to be faithful to you. We love you. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. I just wanted to quickly, um, before Tom jumps up here, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, and just this one, this one is just more of in the way of a reminder. We, we talked about um, obstacle, a little bit of some of the obstacles yes, uh, last week. One of the biggest obstacles we face is it's knowing what we are actually responsible for when we share our faith. So what what are what are we responsible for? And I'll, I'll ask the question for the sharing. class. What? Sharing. sharing. Exactly right. We are responsible for getting the message from our mouth to their ears. That's that's what we're responsible for. God is responsible for getting the message from their ears to their hearts. Okay? And I think sometimes that's we 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 put a lot of pressure on ourselves because we think we have to be so convincing or we have to be so so right or so whatever so that we can get the message to their ears all the way to their hearts. But that's not our job. That's not what we're called to do. We're called simply to get the message from our mouth to our ears. And um, that's that's so that should hopefully in some way lighten the burden, lighten the load to say, you know what, I don't have to get it to their hearts. That's that's God's work. That's the Holy Spirit's work. That's between them and the Holy Spirit. My job is to get the message from, from my mouth to their ears. We talked about um, some external barriers last week. Uh, I wanted to add just a couple of those. One of those is people, well, a barrier that, that's out of your control is that sometimes people just already have negative pre, uh, pre I can't say the word, preconceived ideas about Christianity, okay, because of past experiences that they've had. Uh, because of thoughts that they have, whether they're um, ideas that they have, whether they're true or not. But that's probably some barriers that you're going to face, even with people, uh, whether it's somebody that you don't know or somebody that you do know, there's going to be some of those that, you, that, that you'll that that you have to deal with. Again, that's external. That's not on you. Um, but it just comes from bad experience, maybe bad information. But I think the best thing to do in that situation is to just simply listen. Listen to their story. Listen to what they're saying. Because in a lot of times, what in listening, what you're going to hear is what's important to them, and you can and you can talk about that. Um, especially in this world, another external barrier you're going to you're going to hit is self reliance, right? People just they don't think they need God. They don't they don't need anything. They uh, some people think they're good enough, or you know what? They have enough money. They have enough this. They have enough that. They're good. What do I need God for? Uh, so that's a, that's an again an external barrier that you're going to face, and that's not. Anything you did, that's just kind of the, the an idea that somebody's already going to come up with. Another thing you might come up with, and, and again, is people might be afraid because there is a cost to following Christ, right? You know this. As, as a believer, there is a cost. And some people may just be darn right afraid of, okay, if I say yes to this, then guess what's going to happen? There's going to have to be some changes in my life. I have visited with uh, uh, two people Two weeks ago, I visited with them again last week. Is that right? Anyway, shared the gospel uh, with them. I had a great conversation. They both accepted and, and prayed. I mean, the Lord was really working. And um, so that was that was on a Sunday when I had this opportunity. And then they go through the week, and I, I asked to meet with them again the next following Sunday. And one of them said, I almost didn't come back to meet with you. And I was like, really? Why? is because this has been one of the worst weeks of my life, worst weeks, attacks. And um, they felt like the only thing that was different <laughs> was that they that they met, you know, they met here and they accepted Christ. And, and they were like, you know, if this is what it's going to be like, they were just they were so nervous, so afraid. So because, you know, it's going to cost. It'll cost. And some people just don't want to don't want to pay that cost. So. Uh, something you have to think of. Now, quickly before Tom gets up here, we're talking about sharing with family, sharing with friends. Here's some things that I want you to avoid. 
Um, and, um, you're, and, and just to be careful when you're sharing with people that know you and you know them. First one is this, is allowing them to push your buttons. Okay. Who knows you better than your family? Who knows you better than your friends? And so they also know how to best get you, how to best goad you. And so you have to be careful with that. Don't let them, don't let them press buttons even when they're trying to. You just have to be real careful. No one knows you better. That's a good thing, but also it can be a negative thing. So be careful you don't allow them to push your buttons. Second thing is be careful that you are not, not sharing with them because you believe that they'll never change. Okay? That you believe that they'll never change. Yes, it's, it's easy to develop this, this profile of a member of your family or a member in your friend group that, that you and, and you can just sort of lock it down and you can just already assume, you know what, that's just who they are. And, and to, to, try, to try to share the gospel with them almost would be just sort of like a waste of my breath. But you don't know that. You don't know what God's up to. You don't know what God's doing. And so it's like we, we get this idea is they're never going to change. Well, they might not. But that doesn't mean that, that God hasn't called us to, to, to share with them um, the difference that Christ has made. Um, the third thing I want to say is speaking too much, kind of like what I'm doing right now. Talking too much. Right. We want to get all this information. We want to we want to kind of get it all there. We want to make this decision. But the reality is, especially if it's somebody that, you know, somebody that you that you have, you know, that you're in contact with kind of on a on a pretty routine basis is, you know what, you you're not you don't necessarily have to get it all out in this meeting today because, you know, you're probably going to see them tomorrow. You might see them next week. Now, I know we're not promised, you know, we're not promised the next breath. But what I'm trying to trying to get you to say is, you know, you don't have to cram it all in at once. You know, God may be working in their life through you over time. And so little by little, answering questions, helping them helping them kind of think through it. Another thing I want you to avoid is um, worrying that you don't get any kind of response. Here's the truth of the matter. Again, our job is to get it from our mouths to their ears. And so from their ears to their heart, that may take a while. And the Holy Spirit may be doing some work and, and for there to respond to that work, that may be a little bit. So it may not be, hey, you share, boom, yes, I accept Christ, kumbaya, here we go. It may not be that. It may be like, you know, I share Christ and any question? Well, no, no question. Anything you want to talk about? You know, you kind of give them a day, a two, a week or so, and, and you're just checking them and there's not. That's okay. Don't, don't assume that a non-response is a no. It's just it could be that, you know, they're not ready yet. And then the last thing I want to say before we let Tom, before we let, yeah, like I'm allow Tom to come up here. Thank you. Before Thank Tom you. comes up here <laughs> is this idea of neglecting prayer. It doesn't matter how impossible you feel like your family situation is or your friend situation is or how far from God they seem to be. God can do amazing things when we invite him into the situation. So before, and I, I know this, you know, one of those things that goes without saying, but it really doesn't. We need to say it is just be on your knees praying for this person that you feel God has led you to lead the gospel, uh, to share the gospel to. OK, any questions? All right, Tom. And let is a good word. <laughs> let is a good word because it's a privilege to do what we do. Absolutely. All right. So thank you. Thanks for being here. And a couple of new faces or three, maybe tonight. Um, I hope that you remember uh, last week, people, what they shared about their own experience and what, you know, obstacles that are internal to them. That's the, that's the most important ones overcome is what's in us. And because we can't control that other stuff but we can control how we react to that other stuff, right? So tonight we want to talk about how do we begin the conversation? That was one of the concerns last week. Remember that? How do I get started? So we planned this as a topic of conversation. So let me just throw it out there. If you've done it, how did you do it? How did you get started? I'm telling just, I found it. If you could pray for them, good, good one. And you know, the surprise is here. Yeah, um, some great reaction here. All right. Sometimes I ask um, what they did this weekend, and a lot of times that will that will offer a a reciprocal question of, okay, well, what did you do this weekend? Not always, but sometimes it is, and then you know that gives me an opportunity to tell about church, and then then I can go in. You go to church and kind of just go down that road. 
Yeah, and start start down that road. Okay. And I think sometimes it's not about starting it on your own. It's responding to something they've already told you. Right. Mm -hmm. You have to be listening for mm -hmm. listening to their ears wide open. Right. Good. Good point. Kind of to add on to that, you can respond if they're telling you a story about something. You know what? Where do you find hope in a situation? That's a good. Like where that? do you find hope? That's a good one. Write that down. Right. Um, uh, yeah. I just I was working with a, a younger man over on the job. Tony Troy is doing the job on the house, and uh, I just went over there to the steel and uh, got to visit with the architect's assistant. And uh, we visited a long time. He showed, talked about uh, the wall being broken. And, I mean, it was structurally unsound. And, and, uh, and, and we were ending up finishing the conversation and allowed me just a chance to ask him if he said, have you ever received pride in your life? I mean, you have I, at my age, I can be a little more direct and I don't not quite as. Um, so, anyway, I just asked him, Have you ever received Christ in your life? Are you a believer? He said, Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, I was lucky. I mean, that was a little above and almost, but uh, uh, I had been thinking in terms of the broken walls. Stubs, wall was in really bad shape. And I was just thinking of broken life. And then before he got away, I just wanted to ask him and sure what and he confidently replied and there was a still to the good that he was about. Yep. Okay, just now use your imagination. Think of some other ways that you think that you could just you're in a conversation. And the assumption is these are people you know. And so how can you, I'll use the word flip, the conversation to a spiritual conversation? Think of ways to do that. Last week, J Jimmy mentioned, did you go to church? And that was kind of like, what did you do this weekend? So that's a good job. What if you're talking, just going along the way, and you say, here's a, here's a question that you could fill in the blank. What does blank mean to you? That might be, what does the Bible mean to you? What does God mean to you? What does church mean to you? And listen, <laughs> back to your point, hear what they have to say, and then you could jump into, said, well, let me share with you what it means to me. Yeah. The door is is open unless they shut it, and that's that's possible. Um, let's say you're talking about the <laughs> you're talking about the beautiful weather. Let's say you just saw a beautiful sunrise or a beautiful sunset or something in nature that you know all nature sings the glory of God. So you could say you know when you're talking about something together. Do you ever think about God when you see this, that, or the other? We give him credit. We do for that. So that would open a door. Um, here's a question. Have you ever had a family member, a friend, talk to you about times are kind of tough? You could ask the question, who do you really turn to? In times like that, I think also just using um, examples from from culture, from the news, from you know, like you just said, like, hey, gosh, this world seems like it's just it's going crazy. I don't know, I don't know how, I, I don't know, I don't know where people find hope. Sometimes, you know, just sort of introducing that, but just kind of using a a real life example that's happening that everyone knows about, right? Everyone everyone has heard or everyone's talking about and just sort of using that as a tool to kind of get into a conversation about God, about hope, about circumstances, those types of things. Yeah. That's a question I've used a lot. Where do you, where, where's your hope? Where do you find hope? And then they say, 
oh, my job, my, typically I'll say my family, if they're believers and they'll have a, a better response, but it opens the door again. Okay, what else can you think about? Bob, what have you used? Anything? Um, yeah, I mean, I've actually shared like to people when I've been at the dog park, you know, and yeah. sort of get to know them. And one time there was one lady just sitting there and looked a little bummed out. And I just asked her how she was doing. And yeah. she was just going again through a tough time. And so I just uh, okay. listened and just offered uh, if I could pray for her. And uh, you know, she did. And then uh, after that, you know, and actually I went into, you know, Many of you maybe already know or what, and I, you know, maybe share the three circles or something with her too. But because usually when I'm in a spiritual conversation, I'm just thinking, just want to present the gospel. Just want to present the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if they'll listen. Yeah. So right. it's just it, like you say, it, it's it's getting the conversation from mundane things, and we we gentlemen, we're really great, right? How how are those boys, right? Uh, you know, I you know, what about the you know the uh, the Mavericks or whatever, you know, we're, we're great. How about that weather or, you know, what we're doing, but it, it's kind of, it's kind of tough to turn it spiritually. And that, that's, you're right. That's the challenge. It's true. Right. Tom, the United Nations, he had said the other day, he said, the whole world is in chaos. And I thought about that in terms of finding the chaotic as a open. He said, the whole world is in chaos. Right. Yeah. I guess when you were talking about like the sunset or whatnot, you know, ask them if they think about God or a lot of times I'll ask them, do you ever just think about how this world came about? Yeah. yeah. One way you heard, you may not even remember that last week, Jimmy did a 15 second testimony. Does anybody remember it? I don't remember exactly. But you remember that he did it. Yeah, I don't remember the details. But yeah, he did it. It took about 15 minutes. Said, this you remember I'm saying like somebody he was selfish and mean and uh, whatnot. And, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I want to take a little time and actually train you on this tool because it's really a, an, an effective tool to flip the conversation because of where it ends up. Now, if if you were here, you heard him do it in in fifteen seconds or less. So it starts out this way. Now, I want you to write it down. There was a time in my life. All right, everybody, say that. There, there, was, there was a time in my life, and the idea is to say. What was your life like before Christ? And so think of two words or two phrases. All right. I'll, I'll do it. I'll give mine right now. There was a time in my life when I was really burdened with guilt and hopeless. Then I experienced the love and forgiveness of Jesus and I surrendered my life to him. Now I have peace and hope. Do you have a story like that? So I was burdened by guilt and hopeless. So take a minute, think about your story, what your life was like before Christ. Now, if you were saved when you were four, <laughs> five, six, seven, I was seven, all right? You know, there was not a huge bundle of sins in my life at that point, but I did feel a lot of guilt when I found out I was lost. Right. So you got yours? Everybody got it? All right. And okay, mine will say burdened with guilt here, mine. And hopeless. All right. Then I experienced the love and the forgiveness of Jesus. And then I surrendered my life to him. So I'll put the love and forgiveness of Jesus. And I surrendered my life to him. So 
next to your, your whoever's next to you, do that much so far. All right, there was a time in my life when. Okay, good. Now, yes, I do. I Okay. Nothing better than a before and after picture. You see it in advertising. You see it all over the place. You see it in the Bible. The blind men said, once I was lost, once I was blind, but now I can see. All right. So now, and mine was, now I have hope and peace. And you can, you can, you can list a million things. All right, and, and and if you're in a conversation with somebody, and they might say something about you could that you could relate to. Well, there was a time in my life when. Okay. Now, now I have hope and peace. So write down your two things: the after after Christ. <laughs> Alright. The last thing is after you said, now I have hope and peace or whatever your two things are, ask the question. Do you have a story like that? Yeah. Let me tell you, when I went to, uh, uh, and Heather was there, we went to Zambia, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I used this a lot after the, the second day because I found a lot of believers. And so rather than taking all of that time to go through the gospel, I started doing this to find out where they were and then gave gospel presentation if they were not a believer. If they were, I would ask them, tell me your story. And sometimes their story was not on target. Mm -hmm. So I could do the gospel. So, and I had several who would say, I need to do that. <laughs> I, there was a time in my life, anybody want to volunteer to do it in front of the group? I'll volunteer you, Mark. Oh. Um, there was a time in my life that I felt insecure, um, and I met the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he forgave me, and I, I gave my life to Him. And I'm more I'm, I'm secure now because my identity is not what people think of me or what I think of myself. But my identity is in Christ now. Good job. Good job. And then we have a story like that. Yeah, excellent. All right, but there, in your your point uh, early on. I think is the most important one is to hear what people are saying. Right. Don't have your agenda. Your agenda is yes, respond. And with that, with the opportunity that comes, yes. But hear what they're saying. Good. Great point. All right. Bob, do you need the board? Um yeah, maybe. Okay. I shall. <laughs>
Okay, well, he's racing that. Uh, I'm going to go over a tool that I use and uh, find very useful. Uh, it's kind of, uh, I guess, one of my go-to tools. Um, you know, there is no tool better than the other. Uh, is I think even Jimmy or uh, maybe it was uh, Tom that said uh, the best tool is just the one you use to share the gospel. Uh, you just got to do it because it's, as Jimmy reminded us, it's God who saves. We don't. And I know early on, I was in that. I was wanting to get it from their, I don't like the way you explain I wanted to get it from their head to their heart. And I had anxiety over that and I'd work and, and talk and, you know, debate and, you know, probably do things you really shouldn't do. You're not, you're not leaving a, leaving them a comfortable example. And, uh, but now uh, I've learned enough now to realize uh, we're just the sower of the seeds and the seeds is the gospel and some fall on hard ground and some fall on further, so further soil. And we're looking for the ones with the soil. So, um, so a tool I like is Romans Road. I'll just tell you a quick story about it. Um, it's special to me. So many of you here, I don't know how many years you've been here, but I probably came to FBC Allen. You know, we moved here in 87, and I think it was probably 1988 we actually came to the church. And uh, Dick Center was our pastor. And one thing uh, they did while we were here, they actually taught us the Romans Road. And what they did was they gave us a book of Romans. It was just a little pamphlet of Romans. And they went through and trained us in Romans. Uh, what's called Romans Road, which I'm going to share with you. How many of you here know Romans Road? Some of you are familiar with it? Or? No. Yeah, so, so it's a great tool. And the way we did it when he did, uh, when, when we were taught, is the front of the book, you say, turn to this page. And it'd be the first scripture verse you're going, and you just underline it. After you underline it, it said, turn to this page. And you underline the next thing. You just walk them through Romans Road. So I'll tell you a story. I, I find... Most success on Romans Road, I'll tell you, is for people uh, uh, that are Catholic. I find Catholics that really works well, and I'm going to I'm going to share that with you. And uh, also, people who may, uh, may may think they're saved, they'll tell you that. But as you get into discussion with them, you maybe have doubts based on what they're telling you. So then I'll go into Romans Road to try to articulate it, make it very clear. And I use this a lot after, you're going to hear later about the three circles. Many of them, you know it. When I do share the three circles, that's the only reason why I'm not going to do it. But, you know, you got the three circles. Well, yes. somebody said throw that pen away. So there we go. Okay. So, you know, you have the three circles, and I'm not going to go over it, but this is basically God. You know, this is the broken world we're living in here. And, of course, that's that's Jesus down here. And, uh Usually when you're done sharing the three circles, you ask them, where are they in this? And many will point here. Then I'll ask them some questions. So I'll say, great, tell me about that. I'll usually ask them to say, tell me about your story there. And when they tell me, I'll get some stories like, well, I, I go to church. I've always grown up in the church. And, you know, I take communion and, you know, I give donations and tithes. And I'm like, great. That is really great. So then what I'll do is part of Romans Road that I use for, and I, I have materials I'm going to pass out to you to, to give you some of this, but I'll ask them these two questions, and maybe you've heard it. Maybe it's an evangelism explosion or what, but I basically say, let me ask you a question then. I said, since you're, you, you know, you're a believer, you, you, you're a Christian, uh, if you were to die today and you were standing before God, God said, why should I let you into heaven? You just listen. And you might have to pause a while because they may think about it a while. And when you hear them start going to works and all this and that, and you just tell them, well, great. It's, you, I, I just tell them, well, it's great. I, I see that you're a believer in God and you believe in Jesus Christ. And then I want to establish some common ground with them before I go into Romans Road. So what I always say to them is, well, obviously you believe in the Bible, don't you? Yes. Uh, okay, do you believe the Bible is inerrant and it's perfect and it's God's word? Yes. Okay, well, how about if I share with you from what the Bible says? Because I tell them, it doesn't matter what I say, what I tell you. It's what God says. How about if I show you in scriptures what the Bible says on how we get to heaven? And uh, would you like to hear that? And they'll usually say yes. I, I don't think I've had one person tell me no. 
So what I'll do is I'll share with them. And what I'll do is have them typically read. Um, if they have it, if not, you know, you pull out your iPhone or your phone and go through it. But I'll first go to anyone tell me the first verse for Romans Road. Yeah, Romans 3.23. Can anyone quote it? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's right. For all have sinned and fall short the glory of God. And so I ask them, what does that mean to you? I mean, be sure you want to get them to engage. And that's what I try to do, Romans Road. You can just read it, go buy it, but you 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 want them to read it. Um, and so what I do is I ask them that. And I guess I I uh, want to go back to my story, I guess. I got a little sidetracked. There's just so much I want to share with you on Romans Road. But my dad was a Catholic, but he wasn't a practicing one. I mean, he was a maybe a Christmas and Easter Catholic. I mean, many of you may know him or watch. That's what he did. Well, he, my mom died of cancer at a very, I mean, she was in her 50s. Uh, our, our oldest boy, which is 39 now, he was just like two, three years old. So uh, she's been gone a while. And the thing I regret is I didn't see her enough. I uh, didn't tell her how much I loved her, what she's done for me. And so then later on, my dad in his early 60s, before he got so scary, he got cancer. He was a blue collar worker working with uh, making typewriter carbon paper and all that and all the chemicals. Well, he got cancer. And uh, so I was working here in Dallas. I was working for a company that was actually Alcatel at the time. Then they got by Lucent. Now they're Nokia. But anyhow, uh, they I was working for them and I did a lot of traveling and they allowed me to go home. Like on weekends, I either paid for it, the difference, or sometimes it was cheaper because of Saturday night fare. And so but anyhow, long story short, we're sitting there and I just told my dad and I was nervous. I mean, this is my dad, but I was trained in this Romans road and I, and I took the book with me. And I remember sitting there across, across the room from him. I said, dad, I said, you know, I probably don't tell you enough, but you know, I, I love you and I care for you. And you know, we may differ on different things and maybe religion or whatnot. I said, but I just want you to know, I care for you. I says, and I got this little book here. I says, I'd like you to take a look at it, if you will. It's up to you. And if you don't look at it, that's fine. I remember walking across the living room, and I didn't even hand it to him. I sat it on this, uh, the end table next to him, and I sat it down. I went back. I says, you know, if you have any, if you look at it, have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out. And that was it. And I flew back home. Then the next time I flew to see him, he told me, he says, they call me Bobby. So he said, hey, Bobby, he said, uh, I read that. He says, I looked at that and read it. He said, and the pastor, the, the church my mom went to, it was like a missionary alliance church, which, you know, they're, they're, they were believers. And uh, he said, the pastor was over at Sally's house, our neighbor. So he called over and asked Sally to have the pastor come over. And he told me that he had the pastor come over and prayed to receive Christ. So I just felt just, I mean, so, so much joy. So then I went back home. And actually, I was real happy about that. Then we were going to drive up to see him. I heard he wasn't doing well. And actually, while we were driving up there, we got to Nashville. It's a halfway point from, from Dallas to Pittsburgh. It's 1,200 miles driving, 600 miles to Nashville. We stopped and got a call from my brother. He passed away. And I, I got to tell you, I wasn't sad. I had so much joy in my heart because I felt God gave me grace that he allowed me to hear that he come to know the Lord. And I knew where he was. He's in a better place and, and with my mom. And uh, so, and this was the Romans road. So in this case, I didn't even go over it with him or read the scripture. I just gave him a copy of the scriptures. And isn't that true? Isn't the scripture sharper than a two-inch sword? And it goes to the bone and marrow, and uh, it, it doesn't come back void. And that's what happened to him. So that's what I want to tell you. Uh, doesn't matter what tool, share the gospel, God's word, and God will use that to change hearts and lives. So with that, getting back to Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short the glory of God. Now, I don't just stop there, but I ask him, what does that mean to you? And um, I'll listen, and sometimes they're quiet at first. It's like, uh, I didn't really realize it was going to be a quiz, you know, but, but they're quiet. And then I say, okay, so what does sin mean to you? What is sin? Because 
I don't like to assume that their church that they know, they may not know, they may have a different definition of sin. So I like to hear what they say. And if they if they get it right, I say, great. If they don't talk, I'll say, well, let me share with you. Sin, I like to define a couple ways. Sin is just when we disobey God. It says he's given us rules and commands to follow. It's really for our benefit. And when we don't follow that, we're sinning. Um, you know, it's just when we not a, obeying his will for our life. You know, that's sin. I said, so sin's just when we disobey God. And what does the Bible here tell us? We all have sinned. And then they'll acknowledge, I'll say, so I'm a sinner. I said, you're a sinner. I say, you know, my, my pastor is a sinner. Uh, the Pope, he's a sinner. I said, we're all a sinner. I said, I said, now, I want to share the next verse with you. Then I take them to Romans 6.23. And 6.23 has two parts. I'll call it an A and a B. And I'll cover the A part first. So Romans 6.23, the A part says, it says, for the wages of sin is death. And I'll say to them, what does that say to you? They, Usually don't say too much, but what I'll share with them is I'll say, well, did you realize death? There are two types of death. I said, there's a physical death naturally when we die, but there's also a spiritual death. And I say, that's, what do you think this verse is talking about? And then I let them know, I say, this verse is talking about spiritual death. What is spiritual death? It's separation from God. And I'll go back just to the first verse, just to say to him. So all have sinned. I said, God is holy. He's perfect. He, 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 he just can't, he can't contend or deal with sin. Sin separates us from him. I said, so that's why we, we, we then have death after we sin, because it causes separation from death. And sometimes I'll share with them, depending on the conversation. You don't have to do this, but I'll sometimes go into Adam and Eve of how they had fellowship with God. It was perfect. But then they ate of the forbidden tree. And then what? They felt naked and separate and they tried to hide. That's when they died. They died immediately. They died spiritually because they tried to hide from God. They were separated. They weren't in fellowship with them anymore. But they also died physically because their days were numbered, right? So uh, basically, I say, you know, this is talking about the wages of sin is death. And I'll say right now, it's kind of looking pretty bleak, isn't it? And, and you know, they, they kind of agree. I said, but hold on, there's good news. And so from there, I take them to Romans 5.8. Because this is where the answer is. It really says what Jesus has did for us. Romans 5.8 says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us. That yet while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. And I wanted them to pick up on that, that it says, while we're still sinners, I said, look at this. This is plural. We're still in our sins. We're still disobeying God. But God sent Jesus on the cross to die for us when we're still rebellious. Because I have a lot of people tell me they want to get their life cleaned up. they like, yeah, I'm not ready yet. I got to quit smoking. I got to quit drinking. I got to quit taking drugs. I get all kinds of answers. And I let them know you can't do it. But you have to let Christ in you. So, so here, God, uh, God says, while we're still sinners, so God reached down to us, uh, and Christ died for us. So that's the answer. Then I take them back again to six twenty three, the second half. But I, but I'll usually repeat. I find repetition works well for them when they're first hearing this. I said, let's go back. I say, for all have sinned and fall short the glory of God. The penalty of sin is death, which is separation. But God demonstrated his love for us that yet while we're sinners, Christ died for us. I said, now let's get to the good news that the penalty of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So I said, okay, so, but the gift of God is eternal life. I say, so talking about a gift, and this verse even tells us what that gift is. It says this, but the gift of God, eternal life. 
And he tells us how we get it in Christ Jesus. I said, but first I want to focus on the word gift. I said, it's important you understand this. I said, now, if I hear, kind of like Jimmy, pull out 100 or something, here, I want to give you a gift. Maybe I want to give you $20, 10 or a cake or whatever, give you some candy. I have a gift I want to give to you. There's no strings attached. I said, is there anything you need to do to earn this gift? And they'll kind of look maybe and they'll say, really, is there anything you do to earn it if it's a gift, a true gift? They'll usually say no, or if not, I'll tell them, well, no, you don't, you don't have to. There's nothing you do if it's truly a gift. It comes unconditional. I said, but you have a choice. You can accept that gift or you can reject it. I said, that's what God's doing here for you now. He's telling you the penalty of sin is death, but the gift of what? Eternal life. I says, that's, that's again, fellowship, that's connection, that's going to heaven, that's being with God, the gift of eternal life, of living in heaven with Christ. But, but, but the gift of God is eternal life, and how? In Christ Jesus. I said, so we understand we have a problem, we have a sin problem that separates us from God. That separation is a problem, because if we die that way, we're, we're going to be condemned to hell. But God loved us so much, he sent his son, even while we were sinning, to die for our self in our place, shed his blood, I say, and then he has given you now a gift to accept. It's as simple as just receiving that gift. And the next verse I'm going to go to in Romans 10, 9 tells you how you receive that gift. So I'll usually ask them, would you like to receive that gift? And they're usually like, yeah, of course I want to go to heaven. I'll say, well, Romans 10, 9 tells us how we receive that gift. And Romans 10, 9 says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I say, does it say that you may be saved? Does it say you might be saved? Does it say you'll be saved if you go to church? Well, you know, it's good to do that, but does it say you have to do it? So there's no conditions on it. It says, if you will confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I say, so what does it mean to confess Jesus as Lord? We, we, we want to talk about that. Make sure you understand that. So what I do is I'll share with them. So if someone is Lord or Lord of your life, what does that mean? I say, that means you're going to kind of submit to that person. You're going you're gonna to kind of follow them. You're going to let them be your example. You're going to let them guide you. You're going to let them, if you will, be the boss, the boss of your life. You, you're going to want them to be in charge. I said, so that's what it means. You're, you're now placing your trust and hope in Jesus Christ. And so you're going to turn to him. And then why do you need to believe he was risen from the dead? Because you got to believe that, first off, he is God. He's fully man, but God, that God sent him to this earth to die. So he died on this cross. But on the third day, he rose, and he's risen now. So we, we, we serve a risen Savior, not one in the grave. I said, so it's important to realize that he, he conquered death, and he does that for us. And... Uh, Usually those are the kind of the steps I'll go through. There'll be different conversations. You know, I, I'll take time. I really try to get them to engage, uh, to ask questions or engage, or what does this verse? And the ones I, I, I of course, you know, focus on, just quick review, it's in, in 623, I focus on sin. I want them to really understand what sin is. And then in 623, the A part, I want them to understand death. What type of death is it? And let them know there's, there's two deaths. And if you think about it, verses you can use to justify that is what did Jesus say when Nicodemus came to him? Nicodemus says, well, first you're going to be born of water. You're going to be born of the spirit. What did Nicodemus say? Well, how can I go back in my mother's womb and be born again? Jesus probably thinking, oh boy, he just doesn't get it. It's like, so, so he's talking about First, we got to be born physically of the water. So we got to be born to have a soul. Then once we're born, we have to be born again because the sins separate us spiritually. And we do that by 
by by accepting Jesus, and that's what Jesus is, was referring to. So I, so I like to let them know that there's two deaths, and this verse is talking about the spiritual death. Then after that, of course, I focus when God demonstrates or shows his love. I like to focus on while we are still sinners, while we're still in our sins. I like to talk about it's even plural. That just shows like you're being rebellious, and yet God's still caring for you regardless and that's kind of a symbol, if you will, or thinking it doesn't matter what you've done. You can't have done nothing too bad. Uh, uh, you know, God God can forgive you. And so I f I'll focus on sins that, on that. Then I'll come back to naturally the 623 again, the second part. And as you notice, the, the thing I focused on was gift. Make sure you understand that it's a gift. It's nothing you do. It's all what God has done for you. Right? And so he's... He's, he's given us a gift, and he tells us there's no mystery to it. The gift is eternal life. You know, um, you know John 3, 16, what? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but what? Have everlasting life, have eternal life, depending on the translation you know, you're, you're reading. So I let him know that uh, what the gift is, and then the last part, the key is, uh, you know, that 623 is eternal life. And it tells us how in Christ Jesus. So it tells us that, but it's not, doesn't give us enough. What does that mean? And then I turn them to how do you then get that gift? And that's Romans 10, 9. And of course, you can go to 13 too. It's all good because it, it gives you more information in there. If you ran clear down to, uh, you know, uh, 10, 9 through verse 13, because it, it talks about what, 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 you know, confessing with the mouth, what it means and what, you know, believing uh, uh, means. Uh, but even verse 13, uh, even verse 13 uh, ends up for whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Again, another promise. And I let them know these are promises from God of which you can count on. And so, you know, if you're willing to do that, and if they are and they fully understand, we'll, we'll then pray together. And I don't know how many times I could tell you out in the field using this when people tell me they're here. And then especially I find, you know, if they're Catholics, they could be Orthodox uh, or, you know, they may just think they're saved here. But when I, when I establish that common ground that and I don't argue with them, when, when, when they tell me what they do, that's great. That's all good. What I want to do is get common ground. And the common ground is, well, obviously you believe in God. Yes. Obviously, you believe in Jesus, that he came to this earth. Yes. Well, you believe the Bible is the word of God. And once they say yes, it's like, thank you, Lord. I think, you know, it's like we got them, Lord. Well, actually, the Lord, Lord got them with the scripture, because then you're just going to walk them through. Because as you may know, many Catholics or the churches, they don't study the scripture. They it's it's the but when you show it and let the scriptures enlighten them, it's amazing. It's like, you know, they're 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 like, wow, they, they just can't believe it. And so uh just let the scripture speak. And if they're still not ready, that's fine. Um, you know, you, you just say, Well, well, it's great. I appreciate you letting me share. Why don't you think about this? I'll usually write these verses down for them, saying if you got a Bible, I'd encourage you to just read them and meditate on them. I typically leave them my name and phone number just because, you know, and you'll learn that. Leave it with them and say, you know, give me a call if you have questions. Uh, but that's what I do. That's pretty much the Romans road. Now, what I did here just to help you a little bit, I did this about five, maybe, maybe, maybe eight or nine years ago. I, I called it Romans road. And I don't know if I was preaching at a, a nursing home or what. But it's basically gives you a little bit more. It basically says, if you're to die today, would you go to heaven? That's one question. Or if you're standing before God and God asks you, why should I let you into heaven? Uh, you know, listen to them carefully, see what they say. And is it because of your works? And I have other verses in here that, that helps you know, like, you know, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Uh, you know, when I first understood Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it's, it, it's very similar. Uh, but the works don't come along till after we're saved. We sometimes people will think they got to work to get into heaven, but Ephesians eight through ten will tell you that uh, you know 
that we're saved by grace and there's going to be no no one that can brag but it says we're we're saved for good works that God prepared beforehand for us to walk in them so the works come after the only reason we can do the works is why because the Holy Spirit's working in us because if I try to do it on my own I'm going to fail but with God's help I can accomplish it you can accomplish it we all can accomplish it but anyhow let me let me hand these out I think it would be nice if we just maybe practice this Practice makes perfect. So it's it's really section two. If you look, you'll see I have the verses there written down so you could use those. Uh, but you have more. Oh, and on the back, I gave you a bonus. A review of the ABCs is written on there, too. Um, remember last week, the ABCs admit that you're a sinner, believe uh, in Jesus, that he died for you and rose again. And then C, confess you know, Jesus as Lord and Savior as it's simple as the ABCs. So uh, let me first ask, is there any questions? Is it any questions you have or have you tried using this before? I'm just wondering. Um, you had much success. Okay. So again, this is just another tool in the toolkit. The ABCs is a great one. Uh, another one, you know, have, you, have any of you ever heard of the Wordless Book? Okay, there's a book, it's called the Wordless Book, and it's by, have you heard of Children or Child Evangelism Fellowship, CEF? They use the Wordless Book with children. Um, uh, you, what about the Power Band? Have any of you heard of the Power Band? Power Band is a bracelet with beads and has colors on it. Yeah. So that's another tool uh, you can use. You know, I see the Evangel Cube up here. Uh, there's going to be more talked about. You know, the three sorry. There's just so many tools, but really, it's the Scripture. And I guess what I'd encourage you is, it's just share the Word, however you're most comfortable or however you're being prompted by the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, maybe it's as simple as the ABCs. You just tell them and share with them. Uh, it can be whatever, but. But with that, if you'd like, um, you want to break in groups and just sort of try this, just just to share the Romans road with someone, just walk them, walk them kind of through it. And if you want to just use, yeah, you use the uh, scripture there and read it, that would be great. Okay, I'm, it's uh, we've run a little bit over. Well, thank you for staying with us. If you have not yet, if you've not yet uh, signed in, your name, phone number, and email. We should have done this last week, but didn't do it. Would you do that before we go? I've never really heard it. Any uh, any last thoughts? Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Think about this. Uh, I, I was thinking during okay. Bob's uh, conversation about a yeah. conversation I had I did, with a cousin of mine a few years ago, and I asked him that question: "If you were to die, blah blah, so forth." And he and uh, he said, "Well, I sure hope so that that I'd go to heaven. I sure hope so." And so there there are ways to respond to that. We don't have time now, but. But there, there, we have to be prepared to respond to that. I sure hope so. What do you mean, no. Let's pray and we'll go. Yes. Lord, we thank you that you've given us a message that uh, you've uh, changed us, that you have given us life in Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have now purpose and and, uh, and the opportunity to, to continue the work that you did uh, 2,000 years ago so that the gospel could expand in in our own community and around the world. And help us, Lord, just be stewards of your gift. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.